Today, we are focusing on investment banking with an expert that founded his own global asset management company and advises world leaders on financial policy. This is for any listener who wants to break into the world of finance, who wonders what goes on behind the scenes in banks and wants insight into how to predict macroeconomic events. Here is our conversation with Davide Serra, the CEO and the founder of Algebris Investments and Abocconi Alumnus. We have a great honor to have in the FT studio at Financial Times at Bracken House, Davide Serra, that came to visit us here in London. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being able to join us in the FT at Quarter. Many of you already know him because with our FT Talent experience, we have been inviting Davide to mentor and challenge you as well throughout the different experiences. He's the founder and CEO of Algebris. And I would really like to start with a question for you that is about first investment. Younger people in the last few years, they have been investing in cryptos and they have been using apps maybe such as Robinhood. I would love to know if you feel is a good entry point for learning about finance and entering into this uh, complicated ecosystem or if you have other ideas for younger people to start investing? So I would say investing it's something important is crucial in particular at the young age because basically it's the base for which when you can retire within 30 to 40 years you can pay your mortgage. You need to think as investing as something that has to be well understood, well thought and there are three rules in investing. Number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't lose money. Rule number three, don't lose money. And so I would keep it simple. Crypto, it's in a different space. It's in the gambling space. So if one evening you want to go to a casino and have fun and basically waste your money, then you can mention the word crypto. But it, crypto is anything but an investment. <laughs> I would make it very clear. Robinhood, any app, any crypto, it's in the gambling space which is equal like getting drunk and having fun. It's nothing to do with what you should do with your savings. With your savings, you need to be within highly regulated institution with uh, rule number one, two and three. It's always the same, don't lose. All right, very strong views and that's why we love Davide. If you are a younger person today, what would you do to keep pace with the geopolitics and how important it has been for your career understanding the world around you? It's a very, very good point. I used to be an athlete. I used to play volleyball in the, the first division in Italy, and you know, I was also a pro. When I was 18, I actually applied to go for you know, the sport university. And then one day, reading one of the major newspaper, I couldn't understand the title, nor the first five pages. And so I remember asking my dad, how can I understand what is going on? And he says, very simple. If you do economics, you're going to be able to understand the newspaper. That's why I decided to go to Bocconi, understand the newspaper. What is the newspaper? It's what's happening today. What are the rules of engagement under which society operates? Geopolitics and the democracy in the Western world, as the autocracy in most parts of the world, do matter because basically these are the rules under which then you can operate as a citizen and as a business. I think they are crucial and it's very important for young students to follow them. In my early days, back then, I remember in Bocconi, I started reading The Economist mm -hmm. and then The FT. Mm, thank you. And now I do read every morning The FT and Bloomberg. You have faced and seen some black swans in the market. When we have these black swans that affect the market, what you can do as a um, leader in terms of like, not hierarchy, but, you know, as a professional to be ready to these very unpredictable moments with your career as much as with your business and what you did at Algebris, especially in the last few years. Yeah. So I would say, first of all, I've always read history and I was fascinated by it. I suggest everyone to keep on spending time reading history, even in your free time, for a simple reason, black swan always happens. And the more you read about history, the more black swan you can predict. So, for example, I studied the plague when I was in high school. In February 2020, our regulator in Singapore, Monetary Authority of Singapore, issued a BCP, Business Continuity Plan. Basically, they shut the office down. And so the first thing I did, they issued a BCP, I think, on Monday. And on Tuesday evening, I was on a first flight to Singapore. 
I landed. Then I went and did meetings with leaders and says, why are you closing my office? Basically, within a while, I understood that the leadership in Singapore thought that COVID was airborne. Now, back then, no one was mentioning. I then had the possibility of, of speaking with people in Taiwan that had very strong feeling. And then I spoke to a pathologist that actually had opened some of it that died out of COVID. At that point, as I was speaking to some of the most important scientists in Europe, I understood that they had no idea what was about to hit them. So a scientist is only a scientist as long as I studied it and I seen it. But if you haven't seen it, they knew less than I did. Because at that point, I spoke to a pathologist that have seen COVID impacting other organs than lungs. Back then, what I did, I ordered through Alibaba and my team 250,000 FPP2 masks. They got shipped into Europe before Europe even knew where they were. I asked my team, don't use cash, only cards because, you know, the plague used to travel <laughs> through paper and bills. But when I asked the team in London to stay home, people were mad because back then they said, what the hell are you doing? And so I think in this case, leadership means trying to be ahead of a curve, look at the data, act swiftly, and having read history, every hundred years, a pandemic is always track. By the way, after a pandemic, always you had massive inflation and war. And so you just had to read it to be prepared for it. I know that there is a story at the beginning of your career. When you arrived, your first day starting here in London, you saw someone that got fired. What advice would you give to younger people entering in such competitive companies and industries to stay strong and build resilience, especially when they see something so, I would say, a bit traumatic happening in front of you? First of all, back then that was possible because the UK was not yet part of the EU from a labor laws perspective. So basically, you just get a letter, and morning to evening, someone got fired. I was shocked. Today, it's not possible in the UK, unless for misconduct. But the reality is, you need to have some labor laws protection, meaning someone is not performing, you need to have a process, you need to tell the guy, you need to give him a choice. You can't just wake up in the morning and says, hey, bye-bye. I think this is just against the interest of society and business. Because I always ask myself, who would ever work in a company where morning to evening you can be fired for no reason? I wouldn't. And hence, I don't see why anybody else should. And hence, that cannot be a good business. And so it just makes no business sense. I think from the resilient perspective, I think in business, what I've learned, as in society, it's be clear and be transparent. Make your case and argue for your views. And if a data change, be flexible to change your mind. If you got it wrong, says, I got it wrong, it was the reason. But basically, be humble, clear, and transparent. In my early days, when I had my performance review, there were some time difference in um, vision and aspect and how to execute it, but I always listen. I made my case. And then in the end, you need to exercise your freedom, says you want to be in or not. For example, I left the sell side because eventually I wanted to have more impact on what I was doing. And I said, listen, if I think I have a good investment brain, I need to run money rather than telling others how to do it. It's like, if you think you know how to play football, well, you better play rather than, you know, being a TV commentator on how people should be playing. Just get them the field and play. As you're young, be open-minded, but at the same time, be clear and transparent. I think that to me, if you're clear and transparent and open-minded, you'll be fine. You just mentioned transparency, and I would love to leverage a bit on this, entering in the space of sustainability because of what you guys are doing at Algebris. Everyone has been reporting on the importance of ESG, sustainable investments, but of course, we have also been mentioning greenwashing. How do you make sure sustainability investing is truly effective and is as well living up to the ideals of what sustainability means? So I think there are three items to it. There is an E component. We have 400 gigaton of CO2 left on the planet before we move temperature expectation above plus minus two. And it's very simple. Twice on planet Earth, life got wiped out 265 million years ago and 65 million years ago. And you can go in any museum and see dinosaurs that died. What happened back then is the average temperature for the planet moved by plus minus three. We have 400 gigaton. Right now we're issuing about 40 gigaton. Post-COVID, we're actually increasing it, and now we're actually going to issue more CO2 than before. So basically, we're running out of time. I think on the E, there is an absolute urge to act. On the S and the G, it's a long process. Basically, it's how society operates. I think it's a lot to do with governments, how to deal with them, private sector, but has to be within the law. 
for the e-component, then I think you need to get the best people that have been doing this for 20, 30 years, give them capital, and let them operate. The last thing I want to see is someone that did economics tell how an engineer should operate a water recycling plant or how to produce electricity. To my surprise, 99% of people that do ESG, they've never seen a water plant, they've never seen an energy plant, they've never actually operated in the field. It's like tomorrow you have a cancer in your brain, you need to go to the most important surgeon, and you get a journalist to operate you. So what greenwashing is, you get someone that has nothing to do with it to talk about it. That, to me, it's criminal. And hence, for example, in my case, I've hired someone that has been running plants between water treatment, wind, solar, a sea of a renewable company. Some have been doing venture in renewable for 30 years to run it. And I'm basically giving capital and helping the way I can. This is, to me, what it means providing capital for the green transition. And it's very simple. Just look at the CV and see what happens. Recently, for example, I was shocked two years ago. I saw in a couple of large financial institutions, the head of ESG was someone that had been doing for 25 years structure product. I couldn't believe it. The person was selling, you know, structure notes on MBS. They all end up being a zero. And I said, the sustainability. I don't know. It's like tomorrow asking me, you know, to go and run the Catholic Church. And I go to Sunday Mass. But, you know, I'm nowhere qualified to be the Pope. And, uh, and hence, I think that's the reason why I think in ESG there's been massive greenwashing. I think what you just mentioned is really important. First of all, it's not a nice to have. Sustainability is not something that needs to fit the bill in terms of like ticking boxes. It's also important what you just said about the hybrid talent that is making your teams. You're looking at things on the east side, but at the same time, you need to have a peripheral 360 degrees view on the implementation of sustainability and how we affect technically the ecosystem. Yeah. Can I give you a tip? Yep. How do you spot out a greenwasher uh, BS guy? Just ask anyone, what's your CO2 footprint, individual or as a company? If a guy can give you a number and can explain you how he calculated the number, then you know he's true to label. And then at that point, you know he's a BS guy. If you ask, let's say, a football player, how many goals did you score last season? The guy wouldn't have a number. If you ask me as an investor, you know, what was being your performance last year? I wouldn't have a number. And if anyone mentions sustainability and asking, what's your CO2 footprint of your institution, scope one, two, and three, last year accumulated and break me down? And most importantly, which assumption did you use in order to calculate the number? If I can't explain the workings, the math, then you know it's a liar. It's as simple as that. I always advise, do your numbers, do your math, then open your mouth. That's why, for example, I call algebras from algebra, plus, minus, divide, and multiply. Any statement you make must be backed by hard facts and numbers because you can't make an opinion if you don't have the basic numbers. 99% of people speak without having done the full basic maths operation and having studied how to add up those numbers. Do you think this is a problem of like an educational approach that uh, we see in schools of like not building critical thinkers? Yes, because I think the biggest problem is most of the curricula are academic. They're either too complex or too simple. They're not problem solving. They don't help you understand how to come to a conclusion studying the basics. Let's say that you're a younger person and you're realizing this, that, you know, you're missing a bit this part. What is your daily habits in terms of building a critical mindset? Yeah, for example, critical mindset, again, is aspect by aspect, study the basic first, the core. And so I would say, as a critical thinker, every time you ask an aspect, go through the basic numbers behind it and the science behind it at the basic level, Yeah. Um, and I think if you study it and you read it and you do it on a, on a multiple discipline basis, it helps you. I've always been wondering how people like yourself manage anxiety. You're in a stressful environment. You are sometimes in a brutal industry. How do you manage anxiety? That's a good question. To be honest, I don't have any anxiety. By definition, the future is an unknown. Every morning I wake up and I try to analyze and follow what's happening and I try to make predictions, say, on a one, three, six, 12 months basis and longer term. And so the only thing I could do is to be calm and be prepared. So the way I recharge my battery and my psychological energy to deal with this unknown, which is not anxiety, it's I'm excited about not knowing, 
because imagine how boring would life be if you knew today what would happen to you tomorrow. I think as a result, I tried to find activity that reconnects my soul with my brain. As I grew older, what I understood is our animal instinct and our animal spirit has been developed over four or five million years. And it's a much better tool than just what I've learned in the last 50 years, just in my brain. I try to reconnect with nature. I free dive to 10, 20, 25 meters. I stay two minutes underwater. But basically, it's a reconnecting in the water, which is two-thirds of planet, and it's where we were born. You can't breathe. <laughs> you see amazing species, and it calms you. So I try to go as high as possible. Basically, I go twice a month on close to the top of the Mont Blanc, 4,000 meters. I get a cable car, and then from there, I play, I say. So I climb, ski, trying to be as safe as possible, uh, between four and 5,000 meters, and it's fantastic. There's no human being. you basically as high as possible, and you reconnect with nature again. And by doing so, it relaxes me, and my body refines energy. The last thing, for example, now, what I've also found, and in my case, having no one around in nature recharges me. If you tell me what would be my nightmare, would be to go to a football stadium full of people or to a concert full of people. Because in that case, in my personal case, it actually creates stress. There are other people that are exactly the opposite. There's no right or wrong, but that's what works for me. So now, challenger questions. I'll uh, uh, leave the mic to Mayank Saini and Kimberly Heath for their two questions for you. Hello, my name is Mayank Saini. I was a participant of the FT Talent Challenge in 2022. I'm originally from India, but I'm currently living in Milan, Italy. I am finishing up my bachelor's in corporate communication and public relations in Milan. And since my university so far, I have been always into experiences including some organizations like JP Morgan, Amazon, Goldman Sachs. And my question to Mr. Davide Serra is, does driving the ESG agenda mean sacrificing companies' returns, especially in terms of investment banks? Thank you, and looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, first, my Yang, uh, for your question, in investment banks, they are there to facilitate, basically, corporates taking decision and action. So think, if you want to have a long-term business, they need to have company that are very sustainable in the long term. So I think having a proper ESG agenda for an investment bank does not mean compromising with long-term profits. I'll just make an example. Imagine if you had an investment bank that only wanted to do it all in gas, would operate on company that in 30 years' time are not going to exist, and probably with governments and regime which are dictators and are not doing a great job for their own people, and so they're most likely to be top and go bankrupt. I think it's in everyone's interest to have healthy clients that do things which are smart, where society applauds, where they can have recurrent business, and they can be in business for the long term. So I would say actually the two are united for their employees and their clients, and hence there is no trade-off between the two. Hello, my name is Xie Jiajun. You can also call me Kimber. I was a participant of the FTX Balcony Challenge 2022. I'm originally from Taiwan, but I'm currently living in Wuhan. I will pursue my master's degree at ESCP in sustainability, entrepreneurship, and innovation, and would like to start my business one day. So, my question to Mr. David Serra is, do you think it would be better to work in a big firm or a startup for better accumulating the needed experience? Thank you so much and looking forward to hearing your response. So, Kimba, thank you for your question. First of all, congratulations. What I say to everyone, I say this to my kids every day, your dream should be to be an entrepreneur. And the reason is to be an entrepreneur of yourself. So have no limits in how you can spend your day, how you can set your agenda, because basically that it's fantastic explosion of the best in you. Not only you can then shape your firm, the values, hire people, it's the most rewarding, in my view, uh, achievement that a human being can have. Now, the best way, in my view, to end up being an entrepreneur is to have knowledge. You can have it 
from a small company, you can have it from a large company, you can have it, you know, in sports, it doesn't matter. So I would say improve your knowledge and your passion with a coach. So rather than talking about small company, large company, sports company, media company, I say learn something that fulfills your passion with the best coach leader you can have in front of you. So if you join Apple because there is Steve Jobs, but you never get to work with Steve Jobs, you're not actually in Apple for Steve Jobs. You are with, you know, Mark in California. Is Mark a fantastic leader who's going to teach you something? The same happens also. And is it bad if you're in California to work going for Tesla because of Elon Musk or in a small cap, you know, because of Steve It depends on who's your boss, which you work every day, because you're not learning, you know, from the president of the United States you're not learning from a number one player of the NBA, you're learning who you're working with and your direct boss. So I think in particular, young age, I tell people, follow your boss, judge your boss, don't judge uh, the stratosphere. Be more pragmatic and hands down. And I always say, keep on asking, is this the best boss I can have? And can I learn from him? I think this learning is hands-on. And whoever gives you a hands-on experience, that's the best company to work for. Yeah, I think that's such an important tip here, like pragmatic and pragmatic approach to your career and how you should build your career path based on actions and what you can really learn from the field. I think it's really be one of the key takeaways from our conversation. Davide, I cannot thank you enough for your time, especially for being here and finally having a face-to-face conversation. He has been lovely. Again, Davide Serra, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> This has been The Talent Show, which is produced by the FT Talent Team, Aya Al-Shihabi, Noor Hafez, and me, Virginia Stagni. Our podcast producer is Todd Van Luling. Our editor and sound engineer is Arturo Ochoa. Our video producer is Enrique Zecca. And our social media producer is Letizia Clementi. Our music is by Dennis Kishuk. Check out all of the Talent Show episodes at fttalent.ft.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow FT Talent on socials for updates. Until next time and keep listening.